I'm going to present a new piece of work, uh, so it will be a little bit technical. Uh, however, uh, uh, this result leads uh, to a challenge that uh, might well turn into a research project for a few years. So I think uh, it might be interesting and appropriate uh, for this symposium. I would like to uh, thank uh, the organizers for inviting me to speak here at uh, this very uh, stimulating symposium. And having accepted the invitation, I was pressed to uh, finish my calculation in time. But uh, <laughs> I didn't have time to finish the paper. It's still in preparation. Uh, I would like uh, to begin with uh, acknowledging uh, the work and ideas by other people uh, who came up uh, with very similar results. Uh, Steve uh, presented uh, some largely overlapping work and another uh, paper is this uh, uh, by Robert Stanford and Sutkin about localized shocks. And uh, uh, this topic actually started uh, by this paper uh, by Schenker and Stanford, uh, Black Holes and the Butterfly Effect. And uh, there are uh, some great ideas uh, I will uh, build upon. It's Tehut's idea of uh, gravitational scattering, uh, Hawking's idea about uh, black hole thermodynamics, and uh, the idea of Larkin and Evchinnikov who connect uh, certain quantum correlators to chaos. It's actually an old idea. Uh, so, uh, oops. Uh, this is a particular setting, and uh, it's a black hole in a box. Uh, let me tell you the motivation. Uh, in the past few years, we've heard uh, a lot of uh, fascinating stories about uh, uh, condensed matter systems having a, a gravitational description. And it's really a big thing, but uh, I feel a, a bit confused because uh, I don't know how to tell uh, really uh, profound uh, analogies uh, f uh, or correspondences from something less profound. And uh, I, I want uh, to propose a, a sort of acid test uh, for quantum holography. Uh, it's uh, formulated for black holes. So it's not a comprehensive test. It's only for black holes. But uh, if one wants to pass uh, this test with an imitation black hole, it has to be a very good imitation, like artificial diamond made of carbon atoms. Uh, and uh, the test <laughs> is based on based basically by putting a black hole in a box, and uh, we know how to do that. We need to include uh, uh, some negative curvature, with, which uh, produces a perfect mirror around the black hole. Uh, and uh, let's measure uh, the thermal noise in that box. Uh, it's a system in thermal equilibrium, so there, uh, there will be uh, uh, some measurable observables, uh, field observables. We can uh, measure the correlators, and this is a two-point correlator. Uh, of course, it's uh, uh, an equilibrium correlator, so it uh, satisfies some uh, well-known conditions. But uh, uh, the real question is, uh, how do we tell whether it's a black hole or some piece of junk? We cannot do that uh, just from uh, the two-point correlator. So uh, let's talk about high-order correlators. and. Um, uh, there are some uh, correlators that I, I will call accessible correlators because they can be easily measured uh, using a probe interacting with the system. So we write the Hamiltonian in this way. Uh, it's uh, the system Hamiltonian plus the probe Hamiltonian plus some interaction. And uh, if we evolve the system for some time, starting from a product state, then measure uh, some observable and then uh, this is just uh, uh, the cat corresponding to the drive vector. Uh, we get this uh, expression for the probability, and it expands into properly ordered correlators, uh, where the time goes up and then down. Uh, and I claim, without much proof, that uh, uh, black holes are hard to distinguish uh, from junk just by these correlators. However, if we consider hidden correlators, uh, uh, and this is a typical example, oops, uh, the time goes up, uh, down, up, and down uh, sev uh, several times. Uh, the simplest correlator is this. 
uh, then we have a chance uh, to distinguish uh, the black hole from other systems. Uh, such correlators were first introduced by uh, Lark uh, Larkin and Avchinnikov uh, in 1969, and uh, they were real condensed matter physicists. Uh, they didn't think about uh, uh, some artificial settings, just uh, real condensed matter systems, and they reduced uh, a many body problem to this correlator in a single uh, body problem for a single electron. But secretly, uh, this correlator knows that it is a many-body problem. At least it's related uh, to a Cooper pair, which is like uh, the thermophile double. And uh, they noticed that if we consider uh, the commutator between two observables at different times, uh, semi-classically, it's uh, given by this expression. And uh, for a typical chaotic system, it grows exponentially. And in particular, the squared commutator uh, grows with this uh, uh, exponent two lambda, where lambda is the Lapinov exponent, but there is a prefactor, h squared. Uh, they didn't do this calculation. It's actually hard to do, but uh, one can uh, argue that uh, this uh, commu uh, the anti-commutator with commutator uh, will grow uh, slowly, more slowly, but uh, the prefactor is just h bar. And if h bar is small and the time is small, this is the leading term. And that will be important. And for black holes, uh, uh, this exponential growth and its further saturation uh, was uh, discovered in, in this paper. And it saturates at the scrambling time. Uh, now, uh, let's talk about uh, black hole correlators. Uh, in the black hole, we have uh, apparatus A and C applied uh, in this region, and apparatus B and D applied in that region, and we're interested in this correlator. And we want to subtract uh, some trivial part, which won't grow, but uh, which will be large uh, at time zero. Uh, and uh, we're interested in the exponential growth regime uh, without further saturation due to nonlinear effect. So I want to consider the simplest thing. Uh, and uh, the correlator uh, will be calculated by uh, swapping b of t and c of 0. And uh, once we swap them, then this uh, thing should be uh, reasonably small. So the key thing is to c calculate the commutator. So uh, we're thinking about uh, the response function uh, for b of t uh, responding to uh, c of 0. And this response uh, uh, is interpreted as uh, crossing paths between uh, some infalling particle and some outgoing particle, and then collide uh, at very high uh, uh, Lorentz factor, very high uh, Lorentz boost, which grows exponentially in time. Um, now, uh, it's known how to approach this problem that was done by Tuft. Uh, one needs to consider uh, the scattering problem. And uh, usually, in the scattering problem, uh, we want to calculate uh, uh, the angle by which uh, the classical trajectory deviates. But uh, now we want to calculate uh, the variation in, in the action. And this variation will be given by uh, uh, the uh, effective momentum or energy of infalling radiation and outgoing radiation. And it's also parameterized by points on the horizon where uh, this radiation comes in or out of the black hole. And uh, uh, there are two functions. One uh, function, uh, one operator is uh, P in that depends uh, on the point on the horizon. Uh, this is another operator. And uh, the variation of the action is some interaction function times uh, uh, the outgoing radiation times the incoming radiation. And this interaction function is actually pretty fundamental. It has uh, a deep geometrical interpretation it, and uh, characterizes the space near the horizon. Uh, now, the Tuft S matrix, it's just that, and I want to calculate it in the first order in the gravitational constant. I, I, again, uh, the simplest thing possible. Uh, so uh, this is the uh, uh, S matrix in the first order. It has some interaction function and these two operators uh, that are important. Now, uh, I want to skip the actual calculation, but uh, here is the result. Uh, it looks a bit ugly, but uh, you need to uh, stir it a little bit to recognize uh, 
uh, some beauty <laughs> in this result, actually. <laughs> and you'll see what the beauty is, actually, uh, on the next sl uh, slide. So uh, uh, A and C uh, are taken at time 0, B and uh, D are taken at time t. And uh, basically, A correlates with C, and B correlates with D. But uh, uh, this extra apparatus uh, come into play. And uh, uh, you see that uh, this is just the correlate of A and C modified by uh, uh, something. And we need to integrate over uh, some parameters, but uh, that's a technical thing. Uh, first, we notice that uh, uh, this correlator grows exponentially in time. And uh, this happens for a large class of models. Uh, it's not uh, uh, an acid test. It uh, uh, can be passed pretty easily. Uh, but uh, the Lyapunov exponent uh, is an interesting thing. For the black hole, the Lyapunov exponent is exactly 2 pi times the temperature. And uh, that's very peculiar. It's specific to black holes. Uh, and uh, furthermore, if we calculate the uh, correlator between two commutators, or the commutator squared in the first order uh, in the gravitational constant, we get 0. If we uh, calculate this correlator in the first order in, in the gravitational constant, we get something non-zero. Uh, this is also uh, a good test. But uh, of course, uh, it, it, it's a bit mysterious why it's 2 pi t. And here is the, next, the explanation. Uh, so if we just write down a general form of this correlator, this is the most general that can happen. There are some uh, multiple uh, Lyapunov exponents and uh, some functions uh, that are bilinear in operators. And let's look at one particular operator bilinear that enters this expression. It's wj of c and a that are taken at the same time. Uh, there are good terms. Uh, we just think about uh, possible uh, bilinear forms. And such forms can be constructed by inserting one uh, operator into this uh, expectation value. It, it can be inserted in different places, either in front or in the middle. And in fact, if you assume that uh, it's just uh, one extra uh, thing inserted, uh, the answer should be of this form where this uh, p and p prime are equal, and they both commute with the density matrix. Now, if something commutes with the density matrix, it has uh, a particular relation, commutation relation, with the Hamiltonian. And that commutation relation implies that uh, the Lyapunov exponent is actually quantized. So uh, it's like uh, the integer quantum Hall effect. But uh, this quantization, uh, like in the quantum Hall effect, uh, can only happen if uh, there is no dissipation. And uh, uh, the more general term, it's a bad term, it describes dissipation. It in involves two operators inserted uh, at two places simultaneously. And one can uh, draw an analogy between this effect and uh, uh, the Lindblad evolution, which also has uh, uh, a Hamiltonian term and a dissipative term. Uh, so uh, we have a test. Uh, if uh, we are to reproduce a black hole, a clean, if we want to have a clean diagram, not uh, haze, then uh, the uh, correlator uh, should have this form. Now, I tried to pass the, uh, the test, uh, and I failed. <laughs> and here is I, uh, w uh, what I tried. Uh, this is a random Heisenberg Hamiltonian with uh, all-to-all -all interactions. Uh, Every spin interacts with uh, uh, every other spin with uh, random couplings. Uh, I haven't computed uh, this uh, correlator, actually, but uh, I followed uh, uh, the argument by um, uh, uh, Schenker and uh, Stanford and Roberts and Susskind. Uh, the same line of argument. And uh, uh, this is the result. It's some Lepinov exponent. However, when, uh, the, uh, when the temperature is high, uh, higher than the interactions, then the Lyapunov exponent is small compared to the temperature. If the temperature is low, uh, uh, we might have a better chance, but this particular system freezes into a spin glass. And uh, this picture represents the current state of the project. It's all fog and no horizon inside. <laughs> but we should keep looking. <laughs> yeah, thank you.
questions? So, uh, can I understand this uh, uh, correlator as by taking two copies of the system and then it becomes a, like a regular time order correlator uh, followed by a swap? Uh, yeah, you can understand it, it this way, yeah. Is there a way yeah. to see the exponential yeah. coming from that? Or? Mm, not in general. I don't know. Uh, there are some uh, arguments uh, for the high temp uh, for the high temperature case where you uh, apply the Heisenberg evolution uh, to an operator and uh, look uh, how uh, terms multiply. It's like uh, if you uh, have a, a pond and uh, put a single bacteria a bacterium in it and uh, watch those bacteria multiplying. Uh, they, uh, those bacteria might diffuse, and you won't see ones for a while, but uh, after a time, they will multiply enough, and you'll see the, the whole pond full of bacteria. It's uh, this kind of thing. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, if not, then let's thank the speaker again.